All right, Mike, I'm trying to keep still, but it's, it's just, very... Just stay very... calm, stay calm. All right. All right, I'm going to talk about the, the panic paper, which has been making the news a little bit recently, largely because it's been completely misinterpreted. Let me show you the paper. Here it is. One of the reasons I talk about it is that Leonardo Ferreira is one of our PhD students in the group here. So it's kind of work that's being done here. Chris Consolis was work, worked here until fairly recently before moving to Manchester. So this is observations with James Webb Space Telescope. So it's really hot off the press observations. And in fact, this is a paper that came out in July. So they were really set and ready to go. As soon as the data started appearing, they started writing this paper. It's been grossly misinterpreted as somehow changing the paradigm of the Big Bang or making it appear that cosmology is, has to be completely different from what we thought it was. It doesn't do any of those things. So the confusion is that various people didn't get past the first word of the title, which is panic exclamation mark. That's because this is one of these things that astronomers do from time to time, and presumably other disciplines do as well, which is to make a joke in the title of their paper. And if you read on a bit, it actually says panic act the discs, which is a, a joke about, you know, panic at the disco and the uh, band. Of, of that name. Another we, thing about astronomers is they make bad jokes. But it's a very bad joke. Yeah. It really is. And of course, uh, Panic at the Disco actually has an exclamation mark after the panic, which is why they also have an exclamation mark. It was a joke. Okay, it's been grossly overinterpreted by various people as implying that we're in a state of panic by this uh, result that these people have found. We're not, but it's just an interesting result. Surely a title like that would get sanitised before publication. It might well do, and this paper hasn't been published yet, so I haven't yet seen the, what the title's going to end up being. This is the preprint version, so this is the version that they just put out for people to read before it's accepted for publication. Is it rash to even let people release these papers before they've been peer-reviewed? Because not only might the title be changed, the whole guts of the yeah. argument might be changed. It's what is, There's endless argument about this. Some people take the view that actually that you should put papers out as early as you can because that way you can kind of garner feedback on the paper which actually improves the final paper by kind of a process of, of kind of communication with the community by putting it out there and so you can kind of get feedback and improve your paper. The other pressure here is this is JWST, the whole world is working on this data. So if you don't put your paper out as soon as you've got it, somebody else will get the result before you do. So there's a lot of sort of time pressure to get your paper out in this particular case. Tell me about this one. What's caused the problem? Okay, so what they were doing is they were just looking at some of the early images from JWST. And this is an image of a cluster, but they weren't actually interested in the cluster. They were interested in the fact that whenever you take a picture of JWST, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the background. And in particular, they were interested in the, the distant galaxies, because of Obviously, when you're looking at distant galaxies because of the finite speed of light, you're seeing them as they were further and further into the past as you look further and further away. And again, it's hard. How do you pick out distant galaxies? You kind of use the properties of the amount of light that you get in different wave bands to tell you, OK, so this is probably a galaxy that's you know this kind of distance away or this kind of distance away, this kind of redshift, because remember, we measure distances by how fast things are running away from us. And so they use that to try and pick out a sample of galaxies that were basically made, so we're seeing them as they were when the universe was at between about one and two billion years old. Right? So now it's 13 point something or other billion years old. So it's, you know, we're seeing galaxies as they were very early in the lifetime of the universe. And this isn't the first time people have seen those galaxies. The Hubble Space Telescope could actually pick out galaxies at those kind of distances as well. But the prevailing view that we got from the Hubble Space Telescope data is that galaxies at those great distances away, so very early in the lifetime of the universe, were very messy, very chaotic things with blobs all over the place. They didn't look nice and smooth. They didn't look nice and symmetric the way that galaxies do in the nearby universe. That sort of made a bit of sense because, you know, presumably things were kind of chaotic back then. Things, galaxies were just forming, so you wouldn't expect things to have settled down to be quite so well behaved as they are now. So you might expect things to be that bit more kind of random in nature. What they found is that that's not what the JWST is finding. They're finding that Actually, most of the galaxies, even those in, in their infancy, are actually quite well behaved, quite symmetric, and they're almost all, well, at least half of them are disc-like systems. You know, they've got this ordered motion of a disc in them. So not only do they appear ordered, but actually probably the motions within them are quite ordered as well. And that, again, was not what we'd thought from the Hubble Space Telescope data. From the Hubble Space Telescope data, it looked like at those kind of early epochs, maybe 5% of galaxies were in disks. And now they're finding actually 50% of these galaxies have disk-like structures, so almost 10 times as many. So it was a very unexpected result, hence the panic. But it's not, you know, it's not turning the Big Bang upside down. It's turning our understanding of how galaxies form a bit upside down. Um, but it's not revolutionising absolutely everything. But 
does seem significant to me that we used to think the early galaxies were a bit chaotic and turbulent, but actually they're pretty like they are now. And there is a reason why the Hubble Space Telescope results are different and why JWST is allowing us to learn things that we couldn't learn before. Hubble Space Telescope worked primarily in the optical. That means for these very different distant galaxies it was observing, what it was actually observing was light that was emitted in the ultraviolet which had got redshifted to the optical by the time it got to the Hubble Space Telescope. The trouble with ultraviolet light is that it's all associated with very energetic star formation and those kinds of things. It's bright young stars that produce that ultraviolet light. That tends to happen in a very clumpy way. Even in the nearby universe, you know, the most dramatic examples of star formation tend to be in these big clumps. And so you would naturally expect a level of clumpiness that's just due, due to the fact that your early observations, the Hubble Space Telescope observations, are just picking out the ultraviolet light which is picking out where star formation is going on. JWST, because it works all the way into the infrared, then it can actually pick out optical light. So optical light that's emitted there will be shifted to the infrared by the time it gets to us. And so that the light they're seeing is much more kind of the bulk of the galaxy. So there isn't actually a contradiction between the HST results and the JWST results. It's not like they're seeing different galaxies. They're seeing the same galaxies. It's just that the new results are sort of better behaved, less dramatic optical light, which means we can pick out the disks in these things that we couldn't before. It feels like with these early images we're getting from JWST, everyone is peering past what's in the foreground and what they're supposed to be looking at and trying to look look behind and see see deeper. That seems to be the, the trend at the moment. And that's certainly true, but obviously the, you know, there's a whole bunch of other astronomers who are looking at all the beautiful stuff in the foreground as well. Right? It's just that the particular bunch of astronomers I tend to interact with tend to be the ones who are looking at the stuff that's going on behind. One last question yes. then, because you did make that doom and gloom video saying that so many things could go wrong. How do you feel about how well JWST is going? So I'm delighted that I was wrong. I really sincerely had serious doubts that it was going to work, but it has all worked beautifully, and that's brilliant. And all credit to all the engineers, all the scientists who dedicated decades and decades of their lives to making it happen, because, you know, it really wouldn't have happened if they hadn't put in all that hard work. It's not going to get smashed up by meteoroids now, is it? Not likely. So there was this early impact in one of the mirrors which was kind of unexpectedly big. And so it did kind of knock a little divot out of one of the mirrors. And in fact, they've been able to see it, it's degraded the images a bit because the mirror is no longer as perfect as it was because it's now got this little divot in it. But even now, the quality of the images they're getting is higher than the specification for the telescope before launch. So actually, it's, you know, it's degraded a tiny bit, but it's still better than it was actually expected to be basically spent their entire careers working on this telescope. So actually, if it doesn't work, that's their life work down the tubes. So not surprisingly, that's kind of, you know, that makes people pretty nervous. And secondly, it's a really large sum of money. It's, you know, the total budget, obviously, as, as the thing's been delayed more and more, one of the things that always goes with delays is costs go up and up, and it's going to cost ultimately about $10 billion.